Well, good afternoon. This is the panel on religious liberties, and we're about to start. I see some folks congregating near the door. If we could ask them to find a seat and also to close the door, it would be very useful. Well, welcome to what promises to be a stimulating and wide-ranging discussion about religious liberties and the current administration. As you well know, from the beginning, our society has strived to be a home for people of many faiths. Religious liberty, the founders well knew, lies at the foundation of any free society. But we have also strived to be a government of laws, neutral laws that apply equally to all people. Sometimes it can be, seem difficult to sustain both ideals at once. Our aspirations create tough questions. At what point should our insistence that everyone follow the same rules give way to the sincere protest made by this person or that person that obedience will place him in peril of losing his soul? At what point must we, we insist that he obey, nonetheless, or pay the price, sometimes a very steep price, just like anyone else? Few topics have been more salient over the past seven years, especially in the courts. Just last term, for instance, the Supreme Court decided that a prison in Arkansas could maintain safety and security while still allowing a devout Muslim inmate to grow a beard, despite official policy to the contrary. That was Holt versus Hobbs. And as everyone knows, the Affordable Care Act has posed, and continues to pose, the same sorts of questions. Two years ago in Hobby Lobby, a divided Supreme Court decided that it wouldn't be so hard for the government to ensure widespread access to contraceptives without putting certain employers to an existential choice. And just last week, the court agreed to hear a series of cases asking once again whether the act must bend to accommodate those who toil for the common good, but who cannot, in good faith, cannot abide the act's commands. We have grappled with related questions repeatedly. May a religious organization choose its employees on the basis of their faiths? Must a small business serve all comers or sell all products mandated by law? Despite the dictates of conscience, these questions are timeless, but they may have taken on a new urgency in the wake of Obergefell, last term's same-sex marriage ruling. As the panel will explore, we must ask ourselves how much room there is for those who object to participate in the public life of our nation. How much give is there, so to speak, in the joints of the law? And who should decide these vexing questions? The courts? The legislatures? The executive? The people themselves? These conversations do and ought to involve all of us, perhaps especially those of us who have never been to law school. Recurring debates about Planned Parenthood, for instance, show the political branches engaged in the never-ending quest to make good policy in a way that sits well with people's minds, yet also with their consciences. And it is never easy to predict which way those sources will tug people of goodwill. In attempting to strike the right balance, how we have done over these past seven years and how we can do better in the years to come 
Of course, as a sitting judge, I espouse no view on the merits of our topic of conversation, but I am delighted to be able to moderate it. Fortunately, we have a terrific panel assembled to guide us through these challenging questions. Their biographies are set forth in your program, so I won't repeat them here. Bill Saunders, chair of the Federalist Society's Religious Practice Group, will lead off with some remarks about the ongoing HHS mandate litigation and fetal tissue trafficking. Stanley Carlson Thies, who has worked with both the Bush II and Obama administrations, will discuss faith-based initiatives and the tension between hiring regulations and the needs of religious organizations. Professor Bill Marshall of the University of North Carolina Law School will then dive into the current administration's litigation record before the Supreme Court. Finally, Adam White, who is about to join the Hoover Institution as a visiting fellow to write on the courts and administrative agencies, will highlight the role played by courts and agencies over and above legislatures in exacerbating the tensions between religious liberty values and non-discrimination ideals. Each of our speakers has agreed to speak for six to eight minutes. Following their presentations, there will be an opportunity for panelists to follow up on each other's comments. After that, we will take questions from the audience. Bill, the floor is yours. Thank you, Judge. Good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> um, in January of 2003, on Religious Liberty Day, President Obama uh, issued a proclamation and spoke about religious liberty, and he spoke of it as, quote, the freedom to worship as we choose, end quote. <clears throat> religious liberty is much broader than that although it includes the freedom to worship. And I think that that statement by President Obama, you could pick many other during, others during his administration, gives you a good sense of his administration's view of religious liberty. In my opinion, it's a very cramped view. It's not a robust understanding of religious liberty, and it's not really in accordance with our nation's history. So with that, just framing remark, I want to look at a couple of things. As Judge O'Scanlan said, first of all, the HH mandate litigation. And also, as the judge mentioned, uh, last week the Supreme Court took all seven of the cases uh, uh, seeking cert to challenge the mandate and consolidated those cases. So presumably we will get a decision this term and here are the names of some of the plaintiffs if you haven't been following this closely. Priests for Life, East Texas Baptist University, the Archdiocese of Washington, Southern Nazarene University, Little Sisters of the Poor, and Geneva College. Religious entities with a religious mission often directed to either helping to educate or to physically care for the down and out in society. Now just to review for those of you that don't live with this issue all the time, the preventive services, the Affordable Care Act um, required insurance plans to cover preventive services, but it didn't define preventive services. So the Department of Health and Human Services adopted an interpretation that required non-exempted entities to cover in their insurance plans contraceptives, some abortifacients, and sterilizations, sterilizations. Now in these seven cases that have been consolidated, the question before the court is whether a subsequent accommodation that was granted to religious organizations is in accordance with their religious rights or uh, 
unconstitute, well, in violation of federal law, restricts them. A little bit of history will help. When this was first announced that there was going to be this regulation on preventive services and it was going to cover the, the services I just mentioned, at first of all, the White House didn't indicated there wouldn't be any exemptions for religious organizations. Then it indicated there would be an exemption for churches. And after the uproar over that, a month later in February 2012, it announced the kind of contours of the current issue, which is the religious entity would not be required to cover insurance in its policy, but its insurance company or third-party insurer, if it was self-insured plan, would have to supply coverage for these services for free. Now, currently, the law says to a religious entity that you must provide notice that you object to these services being included in your insurance, um, and you can do it in multiple ways. Uh, you can provide uh, notice to the administrator, third-party administrator, or to the insurance company, or you can provide notice to HHS. These cases will all be judged under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which everyone agrees provides very robust protection for religious freedom. And the test under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act is if, there is, if the plaintiff demonstrates a substantial burden to a sincerely held religious belief, then the government must demonstrate it has a compelling reason to do that, to burden that belief, and it is employing the least restrictive means necessary to do it. If we step back from the, from the, the litigation, which has been ongoing from, from, for years in multiple circuits, um, I think that the pattern you see that the administration has been following is that it will recognize just as little religious freedom as it possibly can. And it will expand that only when required to do so by political necessity, like the uproar that greeted its first statement that instead of exempting religious organizations, they would have a, a year, a one-year safe harbor to figure out how to comply, whether it violated their beliefs or not. And what you see in the litigation itself, the same pattern. In Hobby Lobby, for instance, the question was, does a small family business, closely held corporation, have a religious uh, right to raise a religious objection. Uh, court said yes, so the administration amended the regulation, so now it covers closely held corporations. At about the same time in the Wheaton College case, uh, Wheaton College, uh, this was an interim appeal, order appeal to Supreme Court, Wheaton College objected to the kind of notice it had to provide to the insurance Company, so the Supreme Court permitted it to provide notice to HHS. And again, the, subsequently, the Obama administration amended the regulations, so that's now within the regulations. You might say that shows a commendable uh, openness uh, on the administration's part to adjust to the law, but I think it illustrates really just the opposite, which is unless forced to do so, and remember at the beginning, they weren't going to have any religious uh, exemption except maybe for churches. They won't grant uh, religious um, exemptions. I just one quick sentence from the Wall Street Journal, which actually was this week. You may have read it, but I think, it, I think, it's, uh, I think it's fair. Um, the little sisters of the poor, which take care of the elderly uh, sick, believe this notice that they're required to give implicates them in a grave moral wrong of providing contraceptions, abortion, sterilizations. The response from the White House theologians has been to instruct them, no, it does not. And what the case law has said and what I think Supreme Court will say, it is, it is not the administration's position to decide what is a violation of the religious beliefs of the little sisters of the poor. The second thing I want to mention uh, is the controversy that has, at least within the Beltway, and I know many of you are from outside the Beltway, so you can tell me if I'm wrong, but 
at least within the Beltway, that has been really consumed uh, a lot of political energy, and that has been the release of a series of videos since this summer by an organization called the Center for Medical Progress, which has uh, recorded conversations with high-level uh, employees or affiliates of Planned Parenthood discussing without doubt, uncontroversially, I make this statement, in a very crude and callous way, the dismemberment and possible sale, sale of the body parts of aborted babies. This has resulted in four congressional committee investigations and a fifth called the Select Investigative Panel on Infant Lives has been convened in the House in the, uh, Energy and under the subcommittee of the Energy and Commerce Committee. It's going to look into uh, the following, the fetal tissue procurement practices, federal funding and support of abortion providers, and medical procedures for children who happen to survive an abortion. The videos which are available at the Center for Medical Progress's website and uh, other places online, if you haven't seen them, I invite you to watch them if you can stand watching more than an issue. They're very graphic and uh, very troubling. I've talked about the need for, quote, intact specimens, end quote. And that raises the question of whether there's been a violation of several federal laws, including the Born Alive Infants Protection Act, the uh, partial birth abortion ban, and the federal laws on the, on the uh, procurement of fetal tissue. Because there's other statements in the provided for consideration, which is against federal law, that there may not have been complete disclosure um, before getting videos that seem to indicate these tissue specimens are being consent to use these specimens and, and perhaps, well, very troubling that the abortion procedure itself may have been varied in order to get certain tissues from the infant uh, who is being aborted. Again, that violates federal law on tissue procurement. So, um, What's been the response to this, which I think is very troubling whether you support abortion or don't support abortion. Well, there have been bills introduced in the House to defund Planned Parenthood. Some of them to defund Planned Parenthood investigated, as well as bills to provide additional protection for infants who are born alive uh, after an abortion. The report, um, at perhaps a year, while these uh, allegations or this information White House on September the 16th, very simple, the President would veto such bills. So far as I know, the Justice Department has not investigated Planned Parenthood in connection with this possible violation of multiple federal laws. The fact is that Americans who oppose abortion don't want their tax dollars going to an organization that performs 40 percent of America's abortions. They don't want their tax dollars going to an organization like the one that is depicted in the videos. Yet the Obama administration turns a deaf ear to this. So my conclusion is that when it comes to abortion, religious liberty and conscience-based concerns matter very little to it. Thank you. So I'm honored to uh, be on this distinguished panel. Um, and I'll give a somewhat confirming story to what uh, Bill just gave and, and somewhat uh, taking a different position. Uh, my focus is religious hiring uh, by religious organizations that receive federal funding. And uh, to talk about that with respect to two policy areas, one's a faith-based initiative and the other is 
uh, President Obama's 2014 executive order banning sexual orientation and gender identity discrimination by federal contractors. So first, the faith-based initiative. That's been identified especially with uh, George W. Bush, although it had roots uh, before that. And you could say it's a sweeping effort to make sure that federal regulations and laws and practices uh, have a le create a le level playing field in federal grants and contracts so that faith-based organizations have the same opportunity as secular ones to partner with the federal government without giving up their religious character. And so part of that was identifying problems in re uh, federal regulations, and then part of it was putting into place so-called equal treatment regulations across federal departments uh, that utilize private organizations to provide federally funded services. Well, of course, that was a controversial policy, as you'll recall, and so it was a big surprise to many people when uh, Barack Obama on the campaign trail in 2008 said that he would continue the Bush faith-based initiative, although he said he would reform it, but he would continue it. And as it turns out, he has continued it, although with some changes. So the promise to continue it has been carried out in part by maintaining the White House Office of Faith-Based Neighborhood Partnerships and accompanying faith-based centers and major federal departments and agencies. Um, in part, that promise has been carried out by President Obama's executive order 13559 of November 2010, which basically confirmed the principles of the equal treatment regulations and the Bush uh, administration, although proposing some relatively minor changes. Uh, those minor changes, by the way, um, are now working through the regulatory process through a set of, I think, about 10 uh, notices of public uh, rulemaking, of, uh, rulemaking, which were open until recently for public comment. And the good thing about them is that they would strengthen even more the religious rights of beneficiaries of services. So those are ways that the idea of carrying through the faith-based initiative would be continued, but changed a little bit. But the promise to continue the initiative to the great, even greater surprise of many, I think, has been carried out by President Obama, leaving untouched the freedom of faith-based organizations that get federal funds to consider religion when they hire and fire. So you know that that's a part of the uh, Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act as amended in 1972 that religious organizations can hire individuals of a particular religion to carry on the work of the organization. So it's a religious exemption, a religious organization exemption that applies to every position in the organization. But there's nothing in there that says what happens if the organization receives federal dollars and it now is acting uh, in partnership with the federal government. Well, it turns out that most federal programs have no rules about the employment practices of grantees. And so the Bush administration said that the underlying religious hiring freedom is not restricted by getting federal money in all those programs. But there are some federal programs that do prohibit employment discrimination, including religious uh, job discrimination, and don't have an exemption for religious organizations. So in those programs, religious staffing is illegal. Except that, of course, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act speaks to these matters. And uh, the Department of Justice, the Office of Legal Counsel, in a June 29, 2007 opinion memorandum said that in its opinion, a RIFRA would apply to these programs that have a statutory ban on religious staffing. Uh, and this came up when World Vision, which hires by religion, uh, the question was, could it take part in a federal program that said no religious staffing? And DOJ said, that's permitted. Well, all of this has been maintained by President Obama to the surprise of many. The general principle that receiving federal funds doesn't make religious staffing illegal. Uh, even the OLC memo and the principle that RIFRA can authorize an organization to take part despite the statutory ban on religious hiring. And it's not just passively kind of letting these things continue on. Uh, in 2013, when Congress reauthorized the Violence Against Women Act uh, program, it added a new non-discrimination uh, clause that, among other things, bans religious job discrimination. But when the Obama administration explained this new 
non-discrimination requirement to grantees, it specifically noted that OLC memo and set out a procedure by which religious organizations that do hire by religion can submit a form to the Department of Justice and then take part in this program uh, under most conditions despite their religious hiring. So on the one hand, there's a strong Obama administration support for religious freedom in the form of religious hiring. Uh, even when these organizations receive federal funding and even when they want to take part in a program that has a statutory uh, ban on religious uh, discrimination, job discrimination. So that's on the one hand. On the other hand, the Obama administration under a different heading has restricted the religious hiring freedom of religious organizations. And that other heading is not religion but protecting LGBT rights. So here, I want to talk just briefly about President Obama's July 2014 executive order that bans sexual orientation and gender identity job discrimination by federal contractors and subcontractors. And when the president did that, he left intact uh, a Bush-era amendment to federal contracting rules that permits religious organizations to hire based on religion. So there's that religious exemption and then the new uh, SOGI non-discrimination requirements. As it happens, most federal contracting and subcontracting is with secular organizations, so this is kind of irrelevant to them, the religious hiring business. Uh, but there are some religious organizations, including some research universities and other entities that do federal contracting and subcontracting. So the president's action has raised this question, what happens to the religious hiring freedom, part of that exemption in federal contract law, uh, when there's this sexual orientation, gender identity, non-discrimination requirement. Now, of course, religion on the one side and sexual orientation and gender identity on the other are different categories. But they aren't disconnected because many religions have specific teachings about human sexuality. And in fact, various religious employers as part of their religious hiring practice uh, require their employees and applicants to agree to their religion's views about what kind of sexuality is acceptable and praiseworthy in that religion's view. That is, they have not only a belief standard, but also a related conduct standard. And that conduct standard often says employees have to live consistently with the religion's uh, principles, including the religion's conviction that sexual relations are to be expressed in man-woman marriage only. So here's the question, is it now illegal, a violation of the new SOGI non-discrimination requirements for a religious contractor to say to an applicant, to work here you not only have to be, for example, a Catholic, but also to follow the Catholic Church's teachings about same-sex marriage and sexuality? Or is that sexual conduct policy uh, still legal because it's covered by the religious exemption that's in the contract law? So is it illegal because of SOGI? legal because of the religious exemption. While the federal government, the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs blandly says the religious employer of course can consider religion in hiring but cannot discriminate based on sexual orientation and gender identity as if there was no overlap between the categories. So in other words they're just evading the question. So that's unhelpful. It evades the question and it, it's exclusionary because it has led religious organizations that care about religious staffing and, religious, and religiously based conduct, some of which have been federal contractors and subcontractors in the past, to now decline to work with the federal government in contracts because of the lack of clarity and because of the legal risk involved. So uh, while it may be appropriate for the federal government to act to prohibit SOGI discrimination, the government's also required to protect religious freedom including, I think, the freedom of religious organizations to evaluate the religious suitability of potential employees. So on the one hand, the Obama administration has upheld that religious freedom and religious staffing in general, and then on the other hand, has undermined it in this contract area, and then there are worries that that'll be extended beyond that. Well, I think the Obama administration should go back to the drawing board on this. Uh, LGBT rights shouldn't be protected at the expense of religious rights, which are even explicitly uh, protected in the Bill of Rights. Instead, the administration has to construct a way as far as possible to ensure the protection of both sets of rights. And I think the administration understands this in some sense. It's striking that when a few days ago the White House announced it would support, in principle, 
the Equality Act that's sitting in Congress, a sweeping bill that proposes to add SOGI non-discrimination to all of the classical civil rights laws. So in that press conference, uh, the White House spokesman said, we look forward to working with Congress to ensure that the legislative process produces a result that balances the bedrock principles of civil rights with the religious liberty that we hold dear in this country. The existing Equality Act doesn't balance those two very well. It runs roughshod over religious liberty rights. And so it's heartening, if it's carried through, to hear the White House say it will work with Congress to find a way to uh, realize both sets of rights and not just one. Thank you. Hi, and uh, thanks for inviting me here today. I always enjoy appearing before the Federalist Society. I think that one of the great benefits of the Federalist Society is the fact that it's open and wants to hear views that they do not necessarily agree with, and I wish the rest of the right and most of the left would do the same thing as well. We are in a society where we don't even want to hear what the other side has to say anymore, and we're not going to reach consensus unless we start listening to what the other side says. Um, today, I happen to be outnumbered on this particular panel, but that's not by intention. There was supposed to be another person on the panel, Catherine Frankie, uh, from Columbia Law School, who would have talked a lot about the reproductive issues that, that Bill raised. And I am not, I did not prepare to talk about those. I think the Planned Parenthood, but I can't let the discussion of Planned Parenthood go completely unanswered. Um, from my understanding, Planned Parenthood provides a fair amount of the only kinds of services that low-income women get, and most of that, if not all of it, in many states is non-abortion services. There have been some investigations by states about the activities of Planned Parenthood within their states that have found no wrongdoing whatsoever. So I think that issue is yet to be resolved, and, and, and there, uh, and I'm not sure that we can come to the conclusion there. There's some allegations, I don't know if they're right or not, that the tapes in question have been doctored, but it's a much more complex issue that deserves more discussion than I'm going to be able to bring to it. My job today is to defend the Obama administration's record on religious liberty, and I do that without the sanction of the Obama administration. I did not work in the Obama administration. There are some areas that I disagree with what they did, but I want to give a little bit of, a, uh, of an overall feeling of some of the area that they've been involved in and follow up from Stanley to indicate that they are not the antithesis of, they have not been fighting a war against religion as has been claimed by a lot of media in certain circumstances. And one area, Stanley already mentioned, is aid to faith-based organizations. The Obama administration has been very active in pursuing the initiatives of the Bush, of the Bush administration on that. The, the Washington Times, yes, not the Washington Post, the Washington po Times on September 24th noted that since 2012, Catholic-related charities have received $1.6 billion in federal aid to pursue faith-based initiatives. In addition to that, I'm told that, that the Obama administration has worked with those organizations who have religious objections to accepting money and grants and worked with them in terms of figuring out a way that they can still help those organizations provide aid, directing them to the, to the right places, providing the necessary forms so the beneficiaries of those organizations can get, can, uh, can get the kind of help that's available to them. A second point where the Obama administration has worked closely with religious organizations is fighting human trafficking, both in the United States and around the world, and they've partnered closely uh, with a number of religious organizations on that and have worked to be able to accommodate the principles of the religious organizations as much as possible. A third area is in the enforcement of RELUPA, the religious institutions and uh, the, uh, the law dealing with prisoners and land use. As you all know, everybody loves religion and religious churches unless it comes into their neighborhood, at which point zoning issues arrive. Uh, the Obama administration has enforced and worked hard to enforce RELUPA's protections against churches and other houses of worship being denied access to communities because of zoning regulations. 
and then, and then I want to get a little bit about the, uh, the Obama administration's record before the United States Supreme Court because the only case involved is not Hobby Lobby. I'll get to Hobby Lobby in a moment. Um, we've got Holt versus Hobbs, which is the case that Judge O'Scanlan mentioned dealing with RELUPA uh, in, uh, in protecting prisoners' rights. The Obama administration was on the side of protecting the religious claimant in that case. The Abercrombie and Fitch case dealing with an expansion of Title VII's protections of, pri uh, of private persons against private em in private employment. The Obama administration was on the winning side of that in protecting the rights of employees not to be discriminated against. Hosanna Tabor is a case where I think the Obama administration did not do the right thing. The Obama administration recognized that there should be a ministerial exception. They did not deny that. But they said it should be found on the basis of a freedom of association right and not on the right of the religion clauses. I happen to think that it should be, should be found on the basis of the religion clauses, not on the basis of association. I don't think the Obama administration should have litigated it the way they did, but they did not deny the, the central point that there should be a ministerial exception to Title VII anti-discrimination requirements. And then a case that everybody forgets about, Town of Greece versus Galloway. You all remember that one? That's the one dealing with prayer in the town of Greece in upstate New York. The record in that case was replete with the fact that most of the prayers often uh, offered were Christian, many of them highly sectarian, and yet the Obama administration was right there in its, and, and, and amicus curiae and actually argued before the court that the practice of the town of Greece did not violate the Establishment Clause. In fact, I think the entire political dynamics about religion and prayer would have been changed if the plaintiffs had just called it Obama prayer, and then everybody would have had a different kind of reaction to it. <laughs> um, but the Obama administration was not taking a slight little upkeep there. The ACLU was on the other side. A lot of organizations were on the other side. Um, the Obama administration was right there in the center of the fight arguing that prayer at, uh, at town council meetings was perfectly constitutional. And that leads to a Hobby Lobby. Uh, and Hobby Lobby, I think, really involves two kinds of things to think about. One is just the question of exemptions and when there should be exemptions to neutral laws of general applicability. I spoke here last year on the same issue, defending Hobby Lobby, and I said the idea that there shouldn't be exemptions comes from, guess who, Justice Scalia. And at the time of that opinion, I actually wrote articles suggesting that Justice Scalia was right. The thing about religion is that virtually anything can be described as having a religious belief. Everything, anything can be claimed as having a deep felt religious burden. Uh, there's so much elasticity in the liberty interest that it's impossible to contain. Now, in fact, the Obama administration doesn't take that approach. They didn't take that approach in RELUPA, but where they were concerned uh, with respect to Hobby Lobby and where some of, the, some of the criticism the Obama administration comes from is that the Obama administration has been reluctant to expand religious liberty when it affects the rights and the interests of third parties. And in that case, in, in Hobby Lobby, uh, when a burden can be placed on a third party, and in that case, the, the woman working for the particular employee, the administration took the side that there shouldn't be an accommodation because there is something wrong with accommodating one group when it causes a harm to, to, a, to another group. Um, I want to talk just real briefly about a broader cultural thing that's taking place here that I think is what is creating this notion that there's somehow a war going on, because I, I don't think there is. I mean, the Obama administration has fought really hard for religious liberty around the globe. The instances that we're talking about, very interested in working with faith-based organization to help, to help the needy, et cetera. In 1982, when the United States government told the Amish that they weren't going to accommodate their request for exemptions from the Social Security tax, there wasn't a big cry that the government was anti-religious. In 86, when the government said that they weren't going to accommodate the desire of a military person to wear a yarmulke, 
there wasn't this big cry that there was something anti-religious going on. In 1986 also, when uh, Tony and Susan Alamo claimed that they needed a religious, ex uh, religious exemption from uh, minimum wage laws, and the government opposed it, there wasn't a claim that it was anti-religious. Why not? Well, because at that particular point, you had minority religions. By the way, at that point, the left was very, very interested in protecting minority religions, and the right less so. Um, I took a lot of flack from folks on the left when I defended Smith. What goes around comes around. Uh, <clears throat> and that goes true on both sides. But why is it that when the government opposes religious claims today, that's considered to be anti-religion? And I think that's because the kinds of religious claims today come from more established religions. That doesn't make them, that doesn't, that doesn't innate, that doesn't suggest that the government is anti-religious when it opposes those claims. It's the same kind of principle that it's, that the government has as it did in the 1980s when it opposed other kinds of religious claims, the government's interest in neutral applications of laws. And one final thing I want to think about, because, because there's a lot of generational change that's going on here. We all know in this room, 20 years ago, the idea that there would have been an expansion on the rights of gays the way that there are today, the idea that we would see so much of it in our media, the idea that the students that I have don't even blink about the idea of the idea that sexual orientation is as much of a person's identity as race, ethnicity, or religion. You know, the culture has changed. Um, and, and I think what's going on here reflects a little bit of that. I mean, it's easy to sort of talk about the, the uh, psychological harm to the baker who doesn't want to accommodate people who, who the baker believes are sinning. But what about if instead of a gay couple, the baker said, look, I just don't like to serve Baptists. Or I don't like to, I'm not want to work on a, I'm not going to do anything in which, in which the, uh, the couple is, inter, is engaging in inter-religious inter, uh, marriage because I don't believe in that. You know, for the gay, per, the same kind of psychological harm of the protected person is the same. If it is their identity, it's the same kind of religion. And the government's interest in preventing that discrimination is just as great. So I think we need to think about that a little bit before we over, over criticize the Obama administration for its record on, on religion. I'm sure you all in the audience agree with me, so I'm looking forward to the questions afterwards. Thank you. Batting cleanup is Adam White. Thanks. Well, thanks to whoever left their watch up here. Um, Bill began his remarks with a disclaimer that, uh, just to make clear that what he said wasn't sanctioned by the Obama administration. I actually owe a similar disclaimer. Uh, the things I'm about to say uh, have not been sanctioned by the Obama administration. I, I do want to thank the Federal Society and the Religious Liberties Practice Group for inviting me to participate in this panel. I'm especially thankful because, quite frankly, I'm not an obvious pick for this discussion. I'm neither a scholar of the religious liberty jurisprudence uh, nor a practitioner specializing on these issues. My own work, both in my research and in my, my practice, focuses more broadly on the administrative state and the constitutional issues surrounding it. But religious liberty is an issue I care deeply about, and in recent years I've been struck by the extent to which our modern debates over religion, government, and the Constitution seem deeply affected by, I'd even say driven by, changes in the character of our government. Now I'll pause here to concede that as an administrative lawyer trying to characterize this issue in terms of administrative law, I risk being the proverbial hammer trying to turn everything into a nail. Honestly, I wish my interest in the administrative state didn't overlap so much with our current debates over religious liberty. But the fact is, and this is my main point today, that today's debates over religious liberty cannot fully be understood without recognizing that current controversies over religious liberty tend not to be conflicts, or they tend to be conflicts arising from the administrative state and the other non-democratic parts of government, the courts. Let me put the point more directly. For a long time, religious liberty disputes were largely, 
conflicts between broad legislative, minor broad legislative majorities and relatively small re religious minorities. Say the state of Wisconsin requiring all children to attend school and Amish families saying, wait, that goes against our religion. Or the state of Oregon or the federal government prohibiting drug use. And some Native Americans say, wait, that impairs our exercise of religion. Those disputes raise profound and I think difficult questions about the relationship between democracy and religious liberty. Modern cases are not those cases. Instead, current controversies over religious liberty, say conf conflicts between the newly created same-sex marriage rights and religion, or transgender status and religion, or contraception and religion, are driven not by broad public majorities in legislatures, but by elite minorities, either in the bureaucracies of regulatory agencies, or the litigators and judges in courts, or in litigation endorsed and urged by regulatory agencies. And the laws created by these elite minorities in the courts or in the bureaucracies are not broad-minded, broadly worded laws that just happen to bump up against religion. Rather, they too often seem to be deliberate, deliberately targeted at disfavored religious groups, too often the people who President Obama described in 2008 as folks who, quote, are in small towns in Pennsylvania, and small towns in the Midwest, folks who are frustrated and who, quote, get bitter. They cling to guns and religion or antipathy towards people who aren't like them. So what's the difference between the older image of religious liberty disputes and our current disputes? The difference is checks and balances. Checks and balances that temper, or are supposed to temper, political decision making with deliberation and compromise. And on the other hand, the swift unilateral policy making of agencies and courts who can declare the law in absolute terms and let collateral chips fall where they may. As the Chief Justice said in Obergefell, federal courts are blunt instruments in creating rights. I think of Justice Scalia and Smith. In ruling against the Native Americans, he wrote, and pardon this long quote, values that are prote protected against government interference through the enshrinement in the Bill of Rights are not thereby banished from the political process, just as a society that believes in the negative protection afforded to the press by the First Amendment is likely to enact laws that affirmatively foster the dissemination of the printed word, so also a society that believes in the negative protection accorded to religious belief can be expected to be solicitous of that value in its legislation as well. That's the end of the quote. Thus, legislation tends to produce compromises and exceptions. And indeed, polls suggest that the American people today are perfectly capable of striking a balance that preserves religious liberty, even with respect to the new rights to same-sex marriage. Legislation could strike a balance. But when social policies are decided in courts and agencies, the very character of the debate changes. Compromise is replaced with assertions that your opponents are irrational or hateful. Uh, this is deeply worrisome. We should be all the more worried as more power gravitates away from Congress toward agencies. Because these conflicts will, will deepen, they'll become more common, not less. And I just want to say, to be clear, there are dangers on both sides of this divide, not just among those who seek to gratuitously bur burden religion. Last night, uh, my friend Yuval Levin of National Affairs Magazine gave a lecture that will be published in First Things Magazine soon. He urged that religion and religious liberty cannot be exclusively defensive. They're an affirmative good contributing to the flourishing of democratic society. So religious liberty mustn't just be about opting out of society. In Republican government, religion and religious liberty cannot just be seen as a necessary evil in democracy. The Religious Freedom Restoration Act, I think, exemplifies the legislative approach I'd prefer. Congress struck a balance. True, it relies on the courts to administer that balance. And perhaps that's inevitable, which means that bad judicial decisions administering that balance will probably also be inevitable. Frankly, I'll take the bad with the good. Uh, it beats the alternative. Thank you. Well, thank you, panelists, for laying the issues out on the table for further discussion. This is the time when we call upon members of the panels to raise any questions they wish 
with other members of the panel, but I will take the prerogative of asking the first question, and that is, would any one of the four of you like to predict the outcome in Little Sisters of the Poor et al., which is uh, on the docket for this year? Any takers? No takers? Oh, my, I'm amazed. I predicted the Red Sox to win their division. I'm out of the... <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're right. Okay. Bill. Do I predict that? You know, the, the problem with, what I said last year when I talked about Hobby Lobby is the problem with Hobby Lobby is if you defer to the, whoever's making the liberty interest completely, there are no bounds of it. I mean, I'm not going to second guess the Little Sisters of the Poor believing seriously that having to notify violates their conscience, but complicity claims are incredibly broad. The, the, uh, you can believe virtually anything. Uh, you can, and, and at some point, the court has got to figure out a way to draw a line around uh, a claim because they're just so elastic. Uh, whether this will be the case or not, I don't know. A notification requirement, objectively from the outside, doesn't seem that great. But I certainly agree with, with Bill when he, when he argues that to the Little Sisters of the Poor, it's a meaningful and, and troubling thing to have to do. At some point, I think the court's going to have to figure out a way to, to draw that line. Uh, and maybe this is the case to do it. I don't know. Any response? Bill? Stanley? Bill? Well, the only thing I would say is I, I, I think the Little Sisters will win in a 5-4. But I, I will turn on Justice Kennedy. And one of the troubling things, to some extent, was Justice Kennedy's concurrence in Hobby Lobby we spoke favorably about the accommodation, but in, a, in the Wheaton College case right after that, he, he allowed uh, Wheaton College to give a different kind of notice than required under the current accommodation. So the question is, to me is which way he will go. I think he'll end up being a 5-4 majority uh, on the side of Little Sisters. I, 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 would, Adam? I would like to say, and relevant to how the case may shake out, there was a line that Stanley quoted near the end of your remarks, it might have been from the administration, talking about balancing the bedrock principles of civil rights and the principles of religious liberty that we hold dear. Just in that, that phrase, those two phrases struck me. Bedrock principles of civil rights and principles of religious liberty that we hold dear. Just in phrasing it that way, we've already sort of stacked the deck. Why isn't religious liberty bedrock just as much as civil rights? And that's what worries me is that in some of these, and even in some of the so-called compromises, we're holding one set of rights fixed and asking everything else to adjust itself and accommodate that one set of rights. I'm not arguing that it necessarily should be flipped in the other direction. I am saying that it seems like the rhetorical approach and the legal approach that follow are adopting one side of the debate as the fixed bedrock rights, and the rest of the things that we we hold dear to the extent we can. I think it's very dangerous. Yeah, so I, I would entirely agree with that. So I, I was happy to see what they said, but it's pretty weak uh, to think about that. And even the exclusion of religious freedom from civil rights, I think, is by itself stacks the deck. Right. Yeah. At this time, we're able to take questions from the audience. It's very hard to see the audience from here because of these very bright lights. So if, if I I think I see some shadows moving, so um, let's start with the front microphone and then we will go to the back microphone and then back to the front again. Front microphone. Hi, I'm Roger Severino, Director of the DeVos Center at the Heritage Foundation. I have a question for Professor, Professor Marshall. You made the analogy to race and you said that the harms were essentially the same in the context of bakers declining to serve same-sex couples at their weddings. Um, are you really saying that the mainstream religious beliefs concerning human sexuality are equivalent to those of white racists that justified the impositions of the civil rights laws in the 1960s? And if that is the case, uh, if you buy into that mindset, which I think the Obama administration kind of does, um, then I would suspect that you'd be very hesitant to give any religious accommodation because you're balancing, as Adam said, uh, what you consider to be a bedrock right of soji rights over religious principles. I, I may not have been clear because I went out of my way not to use race, I used religion. I said discrimination on the basis of religion. And the examples that I used were 
a, a baker who doesn't want to serve a, a uh, couple of Baptists or people engaging in interreligious marriage, because I do think race has a special history and a special, a special place in constitutional law that, that others don't. But I do think it's analogous. I, I think one of the things, what's changed about, I mean, sexual orientation has probably always been this way, but I think what has become more accepted notion is that sexual orientation is a basic part of somebody's identity, and it's similar to ethnicity, and it's similar to, to, uh, to other, other facts of it. When you discriminate against it, it's like discriminating on the basis of, 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 of these other kinds of categories. I don't think it's the same as a race. I do think it's comparable to other kinds of categories that we are concerned about, and we're concerned about uh, discrimination against those kinds of groups, including religion and Title VII and other things like that, because you're basically telling people that they are not of the same status as other people on something that is an innate characteristic. But if, I, but if it sounded like I was mentioning race, I wasn't. Right. I, I heard the word race, but thanks for the clarification. If I did, I apologize. All right. Any other response from the panel? Uh, let's take the questioner from the back. Thanks. Um, Chris Holliger, I'm uh, here with the Regent University School of Law delegation. And uh, just a general question, perhaps to the whole panel. Uh, given the fact that religion is already a protected class, as we have discussions about civil rights, uh, I'm wondering uh, if any of you have given any thought or are thinking at all about, in this discussion of balancing rights, uh, is that fact being brought up in any of the discussions? Um, I, I'm thinking of your, your comment about which things we hold fixed and which things we orient around uh, and which things we change, but I keep coming back to the fact that you know, we're, we're having discussions about adding sexual orientation to the list of protected classes and the impact that has on everything else. Religion is one of those protected classes and always has been. So how are, how are the arguments going that are kind of trying to reconcile those things? How are those points being made maybe in, in the circles that you're moving in? Any takers? Well, Stanley? Yeah, so. You know, my, my strong sense is that uh, the fact that religion is a protected class is not acknowledged so strongly. I mean, so it, it's kind of there, but when it comes into conflict, particularly with sexual rights, then there tends to be a, uh, you know, that's the religion part can kind of back away and the other needs to come to the fore. I don't think that's fair to the reality of what religion is, as well as other characteristics or what the Constitution requires or what it means to have all these fundamental rights. Bill? I'm not, I'm not sure this is exactly to your point, but one of the things I tried to make in my opening remarks that I may not have been clear is what I think the Obama administration has tried to do is to draw a line between protecting religion in the sense of somebody wanting to grow a beard in which it's their own religious identity and their own religious self and religious practices out in the, out in the marketplace that may affect other people and the rights and interests of other people. I think that's a legitimate grounds to, to, to make a distinction. Um, we would, I, I think if we want to stop people from, who own for-profit institutions who might have religious beliefs that they shouldn't serve uh, Baptists, that I think it's perfectly okay to tell them that they have to. And I think on the same basis on that, it's perfectly okay to tell them that they need to not discriminate against people on the basis of sexual orientation as well. Next question from the front. Thank you, I'm Paul Johnson. I have a uh, question for Professor Marshall. Surprise, surprise. Sure. Um, thank you uh, for detailing um, the Obama administration's uh, contribution for protecting religious liberty. Much of what you said I, did, I didn't know, so thank you for that, appreciate it. Um, in your remarks, you did talk about how um, you try to rebut the notion that there's a cultural shift um, about um, a war on religion or religious liberties, and you detailed um, why that's not the case. I, I was wondering if you could comment on the notion that perhaps there's really not a war on religious liberties, but really a war on, a war on Christianity, really sort of an effort to sort of de-Christianize America. Um, a, a Barack Obama came into office, said that um, the United States is not a Christian nation. Um, you know, we had a Supreme Court decision against school prayer. Uh, we have the, um, you know, abortion is now a constitutional right, same-sex marriage is a constitutional right, et cetera, et cetera. Um, do you think that there perhaps is this, it's not so much, again, 
religion generally, but this notion that you know, America is no longer sort of a Christian nation. Well, I mean, Town of Greece versus Galloway was really protecting uh, very sectarian Christian prayers. Um, there were a few others that were entered into it, but in that particular case, the Obama administration protected the ability of the town to do that without a particular establishment clause violation. I don't think it's Christianity. I don't think it's a war against Christianity in any sense of the word. I think Adam, you know, a Adam really made some fundamentally important points because we didn't talk about a war against Lee, a war against the Amish, or a war against the Tony and Susan Alamo Foundation back in the 80s because they were minority religions and we basically anticipated that any battles between, between church and state if they took place would be, would be done with minority religions because the majoritarian religions would be able to protect themselves. Uh, what's happened is, is that, is that uh, there's been some change in some of, uh, some of the norms that we have, particularly with respect to sexual orientation in which majoritarian positions are no longer majoritarian positions. I think Adam makes an interesting point about that that, that uh, is certainly worth thinking about as to whether they are or whether they aren't. But that's changed, and some of the groups, not all of the groups, that have been in opposition to that particular, uh, that particular cultural change have been Christian. There have been some Christian groups that are not, that have been totally comfortable with that, and there have been some non-Christian groups that have had some discomfort with that. So I do not think it's an anti-Christianity. Adam? Uh, yeah, you had me at Adam made an interesting point. Um, <laughs> but um, you know, on the question of war, let me just say um, part of the difference here is some of the statements that came before this administration, the bitter clingers comment. And also, there seems to be, you wonder about intent when you see some of the gratuitous burdens placed, the burdens placed almost gratuitously on, on organizations like Little Sisters of the Poor. But, with all due respect to your question, I don't mean this disrespectfully, whether or not there's an intentional war on religion or certain faiths in this country, even if, that, even if there isn't, I don't think that answers the real problem. If the administration, if the courts are going about their business just blindly burdening the exercise of religion, even if it's not intentional, even if they're just fumbling around doing this, not realizing the impact of what they're doing, that's in and of itself dangerous to the extent that they keep pressing down on these religious faiths there's I worry and again I'm not a religious scholar but I worry that in time there will be this hollowing out of this intermediary in society between the national government and individuals faith groups and others that have for so long nourished society and in fact nourished the rights that we we, we, we hold up now that bedrock civil rights right so much of that was informed by religion either expressly or implicitly. And so my worry is even if this administration or other administrations are not declaring war on religion, my worry is that if they just blindly hollow out more of this space, they're gonna do much more damage in the long term than they know. Years ago there was this book um, published by the folks at the Public Interest Magazine, the original editors, it was called The Cultural Contradictions of Capitalism. And the book, the argument they pressed and they were not conservatives, was that capitalism sort of had a way of unwittingly undoing itself by promoting values that undermined what built it in the first place. And I don't mean to filibuster, but I'm worried that what we're seeing now is at best the cultural contradictions of modern liberalism in which they're slowly hollowing out that source of, of, of societal good that actually fed the rights that they're now enjoying. We'll be left with nothing but the government and the people and nothing in between and rights won't be enjoyed then. I believe there's a questioner in the back. Yes, um, my name is Venetia Patterson. I'm a second year law student at Regent University. And I just had a question for the um, panel as a whole. Isn't there a difference between discriminating against sexual orientation, saying I'm not gonna bake a cake for a gay person, and discriminating against saying I don't wanna participate in an event, say a gay wedding, because as a, say a person of color doesn't wanna bake a cake for a KKK party, we wouldn't want to make them bake the cake. So can't a person say, I'm not discriminating against you based on your sexual orientation, but just based on an activity that I don't agree with? All right, so I would just say- Stanley. A, I would just say amen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs>
Any, any, any uh, more uh, nuanced response? <laughs> you can discriminate on the basis of ideology all you want. It doesn't come afoul of the Civil Rights Act. The question is whether sexual orientation and that is, is, it a, is, is speech, which I don't think it is. I think it's an identity kind of thing and not, not a particular practice. I mean, I understand the point, but fact is any restaurant that doesn't want to serve the KKK or any baker that doesn't want to serve the KKK or doesn't want to serve the ACS doesn't have to if it doesn't, if it doesn't want to. Front microphone. Thank you. Uh, this question is mainly for uh, Mr. Saunders. Um, is it possible that uh, the religious freedom discussion can be a distraction uh, for the larger underlying issue of Obamacare providing aborifacient drugs in that uh, it's that the groups that request exemptions are still saying it's okay to uh, d it's okay for these drugs to be distributed as long as I don't have to pay for it. If you truly believe that the borefacial drugs uh, destroy human lives created in the image of God, isn't it better to uh, work to outlaw uh, these uh, drugs completely than to merely say outlaw pay for this? Bill? Well, um, it might be better, um, but I don't think it's required. I think it's kind of a, a prudential question. I, I don't think any of these groups that think it's immoral to provide these kind of drugs uh, believes that it's uh, uh, good for them to be provided, but that, and it doesn't mean that you know they don't work in other ways to change the law. As you probably know, up on the hill, there's a lot of talk about Obamacare, and who knows what's going to happen. But um, you know, all, in other words, everything isn't on one slot. You have to. I think that you have to protect your religious freedom against being forced to be complicit in the uh, provision of these immoral. Uh, drugs and services, but you can also work to outlaw them. Uh, back microphone. I, I do not want to trivialize. Introduce yourself, please. Ronnie Sams, Houston, Texas. I don't want to trivialize, trivialize this discussion about religion by bringing in a secular example of someone who refuses to, uh, to serve anyone. And I would like to illustrate in the liberal program Seinfeld that the soup Nazi could decide not to serve anyone. So what is the problem with free enterprise other than the KKK or the civil rights of blacks to not serve one for any reason and anyone on the panel? Any takers? So, Stanley? Uh, um, so I've seen little bits of that skit, but can't speak <laughs> uh, comprehensively to it. Um, I, you know, I, I, I understand the, the good reason for public accommodation law and so on, but I do think it's a little strange when we think about the market, which is preeminently a place for diverse offerings and ways of, of providing services and a different employment context and so on, to think of the market as not having space for some of the kinds of diversity we're talking about. Same thing with civil society, which is kind of preeminently, it's not like government, which has to be uniform, but it's preeminently a place for diversity. And I think the way uh, some of the regulations are applied and some of the way civil rights law is talked about uh, undermines the kind of diversity that's actually a positive thing for our society and allows us to live together with our differences. Anyone else? Uh, yeah. Adam? Oh, my client. Go. Oh, um, sorry. Quote another book by Irving Kristol, you know, I'm all two cheers for capitalism, but I will hold the third cheer. I believe in markets, but I will say I do think it was right what we did in the civil rights laws about public accommodations and, uh, and race, especially in light of our nation's long troubled history with race. Um, but I certainly wouldn't equate public accommodations, the debates we had then about public accommodations and race with modern debates over not public accommodations so much as expressive businesses like wedding cake makers and such and, and, and groups 
you know, other than racial minorities. I think there are two fundamentally different discussions, and I wouldn't equate them in one direction or in the other. Bill, did you have a? Uh, I, I, I think the, you know, the. I actually am a, an expert on the soup Nazi, so we could get into that if, if anybody <laughs> okay, wants to good. talk about that. <laughs> and, and certainly, he can do whatever he wants to do as long as he's not denying people on the basis of the protected categories of the Civil Rights Act. And the reason why. That the, and, and I think I'm just picking up from what Adam said, is the reason why that happened is that when those laws were passed, it was realized just preventing government discrimination alone wasn't enough, that, that races or types of groups could be subordinated by the actions of private uh, groups, as mu uh, and private enterprise, public accommodations, but privately owned public accommodations, and that could have a similar effect uh, as government discrimination itself. Remember, remember what the what the schools did in Virginia. They closed down so they could reopen as white academies and claim that they had a right to exclude African Americans on that basis because they were then private. And those, those cases graphically showed the effects of private discrimination in public areas uh, as having as much of an effect as official government discrimination. Front microphone. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Cindy Crawford, and I just want to follow up on some of the remarks by Mr. White. My question is for the rest of the panel. Um, in a time when the administrative state is expanding to reach broader and deeper into some of the most um, intimate aspects of our lives, I find it a little disturbing to think that the interpretation of a bureaucrat or a group of bureaucrats could be equated with our very first right in the Bill of Rights and that somehow there's a balancing involved, um, particularly when you look at um, the proclaimed right to force someone else to purchase contraception or quite frankly any other consumer good for you, which is not in fact a right, but really just an interpretation of a statute and to balance that against um, the First Amendment and so I'm curious to know um, what the other panel members think about the tension between the growth of the administrative state and the uh, First Amendment. Well, so I'm, really, I'm really glad that Adam's on the panel um, because I think a lot of these issues are coming up exactly because of regulations. And it's troubling to see, uh, you know, for all, all the good reasons or good intentions, at least behind the regulations, it's troubling to see them multiply because kind of by definition they're uniform and our society is becoming more and more diverse. So you can just imagine there are just going to be more and more conflicts that can't very well be uh, dealt with by occasional exemption here and there. So I, th I think it's just uh, very troubling to see that. It's also very troubling because it's hard to get a remedy when the problem is regulatory. So it's hard to get it into court. It's hard to get Congress to deal with it. And so then we're kind of stuck with these uniformitarian rules that often go uh, you know, against many of the kinds of diversities that people desire and I, that I think are protected, ought to be protected. Anyone else? Next question. Uh, Matt Kemp from Toledo. Uh, there was some commentary after the oral argument in the Obergefell case about the, <clears throat> as I recall, the Solicitor General uh, apparently declining to rule out the possibility of tax exempt status being removed from um, certain religious organizations that descended from the new paradigm on, on gay marriage. <clears throat> do you, for, to any of the panelists, do you think that's a, a realistic issue that we're going to have to deal with? Um, and what are some of the factual contexts that you could see that um, coming to the fore? Comment? Oh, God. I just thought the, the exact quote was just so striking. I um, wish I had it handy. I did before. Um, I don't have it here. Adam's written on it. I urge you to read, it, read his piece. <laughs> um, I don't have the quote, but, I, but what was it? The Chief Justice Roberts asked Solicitor General Verrilli the exact question. He said, well, there's an obvious problem there. We'll have to sort it out. And that's terrifying. I mean, the, the fact is, the Solicitor General, they're mooted more than any Supreme Court litigator in the country. And it was one of the most obvious questions in the litigation. It's the question everybody was talking to up until the moment that the Chief Justice asked the question, and the, the fact that the Solicitor General's official answer for the administration was, well, let's put a pin in it, um, is, is, is a deeply troubling. Anyone else? Bill? Only thing I would say is um, I think that that decision 
<clears throat> Obergefell was uh, an earthquake type decision that will have consequences that are very hard to predict. I, I do think, so I can't predict exactly when or how it will come up, but I think tax exemptions will eventually be at risk. Uh, in my opinion, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's, I mean, I agree with the dissent that 40 years of effort to uh, promote judicial restraint and to rein in a kind of an imperialistic Supreme Court judiciary seemed to have failed because uh, the mode of analysis in the Obergefell is, I, I mean, aston I, I find it astonishing. The justices, according to them, the founders intended for them to interpret liberty in a continuing way, however they seem to understand it now. And I don't, that's not the Constitution that I grew up under. And it's not the Constitution, by the way, that existed under Roe v. Wade. So to me, the line from Roe v. Wade to Obergefell, unfortunately, is, is clear. And um, I think it's, I think it, it's a, a very unhappy time we're in. We'll have to see how it plays out. But I think that it's too soon after Obergefell. But I think it's an earthquake of a case. Next question. Oh, I'm sorry, Bill. Yeah, I want to respond because, I'll, you know, right now, I, I think Bill's comments that he just made are really one of the essential points about the differences between constitutional interpretation that, that, worth, that are worth addressing for the moment. So uh, let me give you an example that I give to my students. Let's, let's assume that all of us here agree that we need to protect ourselves against data privacy invasions of one kind or another. And so we all get together, and it turns out we can enact a constitutional amendment. And we agree on that's what we want to do. Now, my guess is all of us in the room would have different reasons for why we want that particular protection, mm -hmm. as the framers did. It wasn't like they all got together and sang kumbaya and all meant the same thing when they said freedom of religion. James Madison and Patrick Henry were just as different on that as as, uh, as, as Nancy Pelosi and, uh, and John Fleming. Uh, so there was a little ambiguity there. But, but also just think a, a little bit more on that particular issue. If we enacted that provision as a constitutional amendment, would we want that language interpreted 100 years from now the way we thought about it? Or would we as visionaries creating a constitutional amendment expect that that would be interpreted by some in the future who could give a greater understanding to it. Now I realize that, you know this is the heart of the difference in constitutional interpretation, but but I always think that the kind of reading which says we're just going to look at what the framers did really undermines what the framers project was all about. It doesn't give life to it, it undercuts it. And I'm sure everybody in the room agrees with me on this one, so uh, <clears throat> I'll turn it over to your questions. Thank you. Um, the next question is from the back. Uh, Bob Barker from Atlanta. Uh, I guess I disagree with that last comment on religion because I think that when the framers put forward the idea of religion, they were really talking more about denominations. And as John Locke wrote when he wrote the, uh, the uh, Constitution of North Carolina, there were certain religions or certain denominations that he would not have defended. But I guess uh, the question that brought me to the podium was more of not the soup Nazi, but the law firm Nazi. What happens when a law firm like King and Spalding says, you can't get defended if you have particular religious points of view and Paul Clement has to leave? Response? I work for a small boutique law firm. That, um, there's plenty of small boutique law firms out there. There'll be somebody to defend these cases. Um, I mean, obviously the King and Spalding situation was deeply disturbing, but I think the great story out of it is, is Paul Clement leaving to, to take the case he was going to take. And you know, Paul Clement's a great lawyer, but he's not alone. There are plenty of lawyers and public interest groups who will continue to do this. Uh, Bill, did you have a response? Well, I just wanted to add one little thing. <clears throat> As I go back to the, my, the very first thing I said in my remarks, 
I believe that one of the major problems we have is that there are uh, people and the administration's representative of this view that really re religion, they are in favor of religious freedom, but they define it, not necessarily with malice, but they define it as worship. And I don't believe that stands up historically. I think religious freedom was always understood much more broadly than that. If you're just protecting worship, then there's a lot more the administrative state can do, et cetera, et cetera. But if you understand it as a kind of a robust uh, religious freedom to live your faith, then I, I think you have a different approach to the issues. This will be the last question from the front microphone. Thank you, Judge. I'm Ken Klukowski from Liberty Institute. My question is for Professor Marshall. Uh, starting with the comment that I was also the lawyer for members of Congress in town of Greece, as a Miki in the case, and met with the SG on the issue. The reason the SG filed the brief he did is because the test that the Second Circuit promulgated, 97% of congressional prayers would have been invalid under that test. Uh, Congress's practice is stridently Christian, including the majority of prayers have an explicit Christian sectarian content. And the SG had to take the position he did in order to safeguard the practice on Capitol Hill. So I wouldn't take it as a sign of solicitude uh, by the Obama administration towards Christianity. But my question uh, is, is regarding uh, the bakers uh, or the florists. If you say that you set race in a separate category because you acknowledge that it's unique history in terms of the constitutional history of this country, and we're just looking at other types of, of protected classes, Given that the, that the service providers in all of the cases uh, currently in the courts, that they did provide their services to homosexuals. They had homosexual couples. They just didn't want to participate specifically in a wedding. Are you saying that a person not engaging in an activity that for them has profound religious significance, just an isolated event, a one-time event perhaps in those person's lives, but that they're otherwise customers, somehow subordinates them, that it, that it that fundamentally impacts their, their status? I, I'm trying to understand where you draw the line regarding a person being able, able to act upon and live out their religious faith versus a, a one-time, multi-hour event fundamentally subjugating a whole class of uh, citizens. You know, I can, I can push back a little bit and say, suppose the baker had a religious belief against serving gays at all forget the marriage ceremony because they just didn't want to condone the gay lifestyle. I mean, you know. I, I don't know if any that's religion the, the, teaches that. The, there are pretty much religious beliefs on anything. Well, I mean, that's part of, that's part of. That's not, part qu of not quite, professor. I mean, well, I, I wait think minute, a Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let yes. the professor answer Sorry, your judge. question I mean, if you don't yes, mind. Sir. Part of the problem, I think, with, with, with accommodating religious belief is religious belief is completely elastic. People can believe anything they want to believe. Some people might feel it's complicit with something they do not believe with to make a cake. Some might feel it's complicit with them to sell the ingredients to make a cake. Some might feel it's complicit to sell a cake if it's actually going to be used in a wedding ceremony. There really isn't a bound on that because we have to take the believer at, it, at his word or her word. And yes, there are very, very, uh, Thomas in the Thomas case, um, if, if you recall the facts of that case, didn't said he was a Jehovah's Witness and didn't want to work on an armaments factory, but he was okay working on the foundry part of it. The Jehovah's Witnesses themselves didn't have an objection to working on armaments. He had a very idiosyncratic belief, and the court said we have to accept that. And if we have to accept every belief the way it's ex uh, the way it is framed by the believer, there is no limit. On, uh, on, on, uh, on the RIFRA or the religious exemption kind of claim. Are there any final comments from other members of the panel? Thank you. Over here. If not, uh, let's say a very warm uh, thank you and uh, make a round of applause to our <laughs> panelists. Thank you, we are adjourned.